I think you're going to enjoy this project that can be sold at a profit or it can be given as a great gift. Hi, I'm Kent and welcome to Turn a Wood Bowl. Today we're going to do a project that's really cool. It's very simple, but it's a great project that you can make lots of to sell for a profit or these can be given out as gifts and everyone's going to enjoy them. Now, if you're like me, you've probably got a couple of these around the house. These little succulent plants are super popular and they're relatively inexpensive, but they usually come in a boring little container like this and they kind of need a better home. And that's what this project's going to be all about. I need to let you in on a little secret here. I don't really have a green thumb, but these little succulent plants are very durable and I don't want to say this out loud because I'll probably kill them all, but I've done really well with the succulents that I have. And I'll tell you why, because they almost need no maintenance. Believe it or not, these little guys need one tablespoon. That's about 15 milliliters for you guys over on the other side of the pond. And I had to look it up because I wasn't sure, but now you know, 15 milliliters of water per month. Yeah, so what I do is on my calendar when I have my bills scheduled to do at the beginning of the month, I also put a tablespoon of water in each one of the plants and guess what? They're still alive. So <laughs> They're very durable and they're easy to take care of. Everyone's different, but the ones I've got are pretty hardy and they work great. Now, the other cool thing about this, if you do have a green thumb, you can easily propagate these. And the way you do it is you actually take the little leaves off and you put them in dirt and some people do it in water. If you go to YouTube and you check succulent propagation, you're gonna see a bunch of videos and you'll learn how to do it. But you could take one of these plants and make like 30 other plants from it. So it, you can have a, a ton of these if you really want. And you can make a ton of the projects that we're working on today. And then you've got these great products that you can either give as wonderful gifts or you can sell them and make a profit. So with that be, all being said, let's go ahead and dive into today's project. Okay, so we're gonna do an end-to-end -end turning. This is not our typical side grain mounted bull blank. Instead, we've got a stock of wood here that is mounted with the end grain at the headstock and the tailstock. So the grain is running parallel to the rail of the bed. Now I've turned this a while back. I roughed it out from some pecan that I had. This is spalted pecan, which is beautiful wood. I'm using a spindle roughing gouge to straighten out and true up this rotation. This piece is about four inches wide or about 10 centimeters, and it's about 20 centimeters or eight inches long. I'm just gonna true this up and clean it up a little bit so we can get it ready for what we're gonna be doing next. Now, this particular piece of wood, I, as you know, I'm typically making bowls, so I'm trying to make cut logs at a length that can give me a good size bowl blank. But inevitably, there'll be a log that's short. And it's relatively large diameter, but it's short. So if I were to cut a side grain bowl out of it, it's not going to give me much material. So instead of trying to make small bowls out of a log like that, I'll cut some sections that can be turned in spindle turnings like this. Now, of course, I don't do this very often, but they're nice to have around because you never know what kind of projects you can do with them. And this is a great example of that. So what I'm doing now is I'm using the spindle detail gouge to shape the tenon on the bottom of this blank. I'm gonna reverse this and put it in the four jaw chuck so I've got a really secure connection back at the headstock of the lathe. All right, that's looking pretty good. Now you could do this project with any type of wood this spalted pecan is just, it's just a gorgeous wood to have around. You can do so much with it, it's, it's so cool to look at. Okay, so now that we've got a secure connection back at the headstock, we can do a little bit more aggressive turning on this blank. I am gonna bring the tailstock up for some added support though, initially. Now I'm going to use my calipers to get the 
diameter of the piece, and then I'm going to mark that shape on the blank. So I'll know the top and bottom. The goal here is I'm going to make a sphere. It doesn't have to be a perfect sphere, but it's going to be pretty close. So I want it to be roughly the same height as it is the same as the diameter. So I'm going to check this a couple times. Then I'll go ahead and mark those lines, make them real clear. So that'd be the top and the bottom of the sphere that I'll be turning. Then I also like to mark the center and then halfway between the top and bottom and the center. So I'll end up with five marks there. The center line is going to be intact the whole time because that's going to be the high spot of the sphere. Now I'm using my half inch bowl gouge. You can use a spindle gouge here. I'm just used to using the bowl gouge. Use the tool that you're most comfortable with. So I'm rotating the bowl gouge in the direction of the cut and I'm cutting with the supported grain. Now this, uh, keep in mind, this is a side grain or an ingrain mounted blank. So I want to move from the high spot down to the low spot to have supported grain structure. Now I've got a video all about supported grain cuts. You're going to want to check that out if this is at all confusing. So what I'm doing is just rotate the tool to the left and slowly start making that curve. This excess material out on the end can be removed and I'm just going to whittle that down quickly here. And that will allow me to be able to continue the curve shape. Now watch across the piece you're turning as the shape is being formed. You don't want to watch right on the tool necessarily. You want to watch the shape at the top of the turning. And take your time. Just make small cuts here. So you're basically just going to work a little bit at a time. And I like to work both sides. That way I can compare it, compare each side to see how the shape's turning out. Now, the, the interesting thing about doing this and marking the top and bottom of that, it's kind of an optical illusion because it feels like that line on the left that you see here is much farther down than the bottom of the sphere, but it really isn't. But that would be the very, very bottom of the sphere if we were to continue that. So just make light, gentle cuts and watch the curve as you go. And you're gonna rotate the flute of the gouge in the direction of the cut for each cut. I can see on the right side I've got a little bit of a high spot here so I'm going to just slowly make light cuts. Just let the bevel rub first without engaging the cutting edge and then slowly lift the handle until the cutting edge starts making a, a cut. That's how you're going to get a really nice light cut here. And see how that center line is intact? We're basically working the left and right side of, from that center line. So we never want to touch that center line because that's going to be the widest part of our sphere. Okay, so with the general shape of this, the sphere established, I'm going to reduce and remove this material at the top here. There's actually a wormhole void in there. You can see that just kind of came and went. If I, if I were depending on that tailstock to be holding the piece in place, I would be super cautious right now. But remember, I've got the four jaw chuck that's really holding everything. The, the tailstock is just helping out. Now I'm also using a shear scrape just to take down a little bit of a high spot there. And we'll just whittle this away. All right, and then there's some rough material in the center of the top. I'm not really worried about that because we're going to remove that because that's going to be the opening for this planter. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a Forstner bit that's roughly the size of the plant. And this particular Forstner bit is a two inch Forstner bit or five centimeters. And then I'm going to use the Jacobs chuck in the tailstock mount the Forstner bit and we're going to drill out the cavity for the center of this planter. We want to take the lathe speed down a bit. You don't want it to be turning super fast when you're drilling. I'm also going to check the depth here of how deep I want to make that and it's about 
seven centimeters or about two and three quarters of an inch, which happens to be at about the point of the Jacob chuck. So I'm gonna put the tip of the Jacob chuck right up to the opening as when it enters the planter. You want to start really slow. There's a little bit or a spike in the center of the Forstner bit. You really want to let that get itself centered and grip. And you want to make this initial cut very slow so that it doesn't, it doesn't come off center and create any kind of vibration. Just take your time. I'm working the crank on the tailstock, but I'm also holding the chuck so the chuck doesn't spin. The Forstner bit there is a little bit loose, so I mean I need to tighten that up in the Jacobs chuck as well. Back it out frequently and clear any material away from the Forstner bit. There's a lot of friction here, so that those shavings coming out of there are very hot. And it's a good idea to give it Give the bit a little bit of a break, clear out some of that excess material. It's always a great idea to have different types of stock, wood stock available to turn. And periodically, I'll cut a whole bunch of these ingrain turning columns and then I'll rough them out with the spindle roughing gouge and then I'll set them aside. This has been setting aside for several years, so it's very dry. There's no moisture content in here at all or no noticeable moisture content. There's always moisture in wood. But you can see the dust coming out of this is very fine. And it's relatively dry and very stable. So I'm not going to worry about this changing shape as we finish it. That's the other nice thing about these. You can turn and rough them out in this column shape and they're pretty much ready to go. And then you can set them in a box like I do and just forget about them. These have been, like I said, these have been out drying for several years now and they're in relatively good shape. So almost at the depth I need here. I've got the Jacobs chuck right at the opening and we're set. So I don't want to go any deeper than that. So we have our interior hole established. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sand. I'm starting with 80 grit. I can tell that the shape is not exactly what I want at this moment. There's a there's a little bit of rough spots, a little bit of high spots, and quite honestly, we're going to do a little bit of shaping with the sander here. I've got my respirator on, and I'm running my air filtration system as well. You want to be careful with this fine dust, especially with dry material like this. It is super dangerous for our lungs. We do not want to be inhaling this at all. And just like turning, I'm looking at the top of the profile of this turn piece as I'm sanding. And I'm looking for the high spots, or I'm looking for little areas that need adjustment, and I'm working those areas as I'm sanding it. And I'm sanding at the bottom of this so that the sanding disc doesn't catch. Essentially, the material is moving right across the sanding pad smoothly, so there's no catch and it doesn't take the drill and you want to pull it into it. So I'm going to switch out the disc and I'm going to move through my sanding grits. I usually start at 120. With this one, I wanted to do more shaping, so I started at 80 grit. And now I'm at 120. I'll move to 180, 240 and 320. So I've got a nice smooth finish. I usually stop at 320. That's going to give me a a, a very smooth finish. And it goes pretty quickly. At this point, with the piece shaped the way I want, I basically just go through each of the grits one at a time. So I've got a nice smooth finish on the outside of this planter. Okay, so now I have to start working the base of this and figuring out exactly where that's going to be. So we have the shape of this 
bottom of the planner itself, and I do want it to be relatively spherical. Right now I can see that the bottom of this is coming out of that sphere and it kind of almost has like a teardrop shape. I want to take it more into a sphere shape and I want to bring it down to that, the bottom of that sphere. So I'm going to make a very light cut. Again, I'm rotating the flute of the gouge in the direction of the cut. That's looking a little bit better. Very light cut here. Again, just rub the bevel of the tool and, and slowly let the tip engage. Now I'm going to use my thin parting tool and I'm going to start cutting in to shape the base of this piece. Now I'm going to remove some excess material with the parting tool so I have more space. This is always a good idea with the parting tool is to make the cut area wider than the tool. If you just go straight in with the parting tool, eventually the piece is going to bind up. Okay, before I part this from the lathe, I'm going to clean it out really good. Now this has some wormholes in it, so I'm using compressed air to blow out some of those cavities so I don't have dust in there. And there you can see some of the wormholes in there. I'm totally fine with that. It gives us a lot of character. Some people would claim that this is not usable wood. I, I actually love it because there's a ton of character, plus all that spalted graphic lines everywhere. It's just fantastic. Now I'm going to use some shellac that I've created or made. I've made this myself with shellac flakes. If you want to learn how to make your own shellac, I've got a video for that. Check the link above. Now this shellac is going to do two things here. It's going to bind together any of the dry material. It's actually acting like a glue and it's going to bind together that dry material. It's also going to coat the surface and it's going to make it easier to create a gloss or a shiny surface on this wood. This wood is relatively porous and dull. The way we get a gloss, glossy or shiny surface is to have a lot of reflection from that surface and that surface has to be smooth. Well, if we've got a surface with a lot of bumps and dry ridges in it, it's not smooth so it's going to be hard to make it shiny. The shellac will help fill in those rough areas and it creates kind of like a film layer that starts making that surface a little bit more shiny. And this will be a great undercoating for a lacquer finish. Now, as you might guess, you might be wondering about those wormholes in the middle of this planner. Well, they could be a, po a problem down the road. So what I'm going to do, and I also don't want water soaking into the wood inside where the plant is going to be. So I'm going to take some five minute epoxy. The five minute epoxy has two parts. There's a resin portion and a hardening portion, and we need equal amounts of each of those. So I'm going to squeeze out two parts of the epoxy, the, the hardener and the resin, and then mix those together thoroughly. Now this is a simple five minute epoxy. Now I'll have a link to this in the description below the video along with all the other materials that I've used in this video. So check those out. But this is a great way to seal the inside of a, a planner like this. So I'm going to carefully wipe this down the sides of the interior. Try not to get it on the outside there. It's kind of drippy. It's like honey. It's about the same consistency as honey. So it's, it, And it's about as sticky as honey right now. So I'm just going to wipe that around. It doesn't take that much to get all the way around the inside of this particular piece. But I also need to get the bottom of this and it's not going to be easy in this orientation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop this off the lathe and then also fill that bottom portion. I got a little bit of residue on the rim there. I wanted to clean that up first. You can let that spin a little bit and it prevents it from setting and, or settling in one area or, and or running. You obviously don't want it to be super thick in there. You also don't want to run the lathe super fast because that'll just sling it everywhere. So if you have a low setting on your lathe, you can run it like that for a while and let it dry. 
Now I'm using the same batch. I could make another batch if I wanted to and come back over her second portion. And I'm going to work that down into the bottom of this piece and fill in those holes at the bottom. Just take your time and make sure you get it in all the different crevices. By keeping it in the chuck, I know that it's going to be true and rotate properly when I go to turn off the bottom. So that's why I didn't take it out of the chuck. Instead, I took the chuck off the lathe. And at this point, it's gotten very tacky because a few minutes have gone by. So it's sitting really well in the bottom of that. I'm not worried about it slinging out. If I had just mixed it and put it in there right now, it would probably be running all over if I turned the lathe on. So I'm going to use a, just a quick couple sprays of canned lacquer. And I'm going to coat the exterior of this piece. If I do a bunch of different pieces, I like to use my sprayer and the pre-cat lacquer from the can. But for a small piece like this, canned lacquer is great. And also, I'll put a link to that in the description below. Okay, now it's time to part this off the lathe. I've let this dry really well, both the epoxy on the, in the inside and the lacquer on the outside. So I'm using my thin parting tool. If you see that I'm in a sharp angle, well, not a sharp angle, but I'm angled up towards the center. And the reason for that is I don't want the bottom of this piece to be flat. I definitely don't want it to be convex. I want it to be slightly concave. So I'm just going to work my way through here, slowly removing material as I go. I'm going to take away some of that excess material so the tool has room. But you can see the angle that I'm creating. I'm going up into the center to create a concave bottom. This will allow it to seat flat on a tabletop. So it's not wobbling around. It's a little bit awkward. I'm using my left hand, which I don't usually do, to hold the parting tool. And I'm going to grab it with my right hand. And actually, I don't want that tool rest in the way. Because if somehow my fingers get grabbed, or if I grab onto that and get a, I've got a pinch point with that tool rest in the way. So instead, I'll move the tool rest off to the side. And if for some reason, my hand gets twisted around. The tool rest won't be there. But I'm just putting a light grip on the piece as I'm applying pressure with the parting tool. You don't want to try to grab it. You just don't want it to go flying across the room. And there we go. All right, so now it's time for my green thumb. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. There's quite a, quite a bit of roots in here. I've got plenty of soil in the little container. Going to work the plant into the planter. The other thing is this particular succulents grow really slow. Oops. See, I told you I don't have much of a green thumb. They, they grow really slow. So it's not as if this thing is going to grow out of this container in a, in a few weeks. It'll take months before this gets overgrown. And you can reduce the size of them by taking off some of those excess leaves and and actually propagating them and turning them into other plants. Wow, that looked pretty cool. Actually, I really like the shape of the sphere with the shape of the plant. That worked out really, really well. And look at that spalting. Now this will work with any wood. If you can get spalted wood, then that's that's you can do something really nice like this too. But again, any wood will work. Just use your imagination. You can also create any shape. I happen to make a sphere here, but you can make any shape you'd like. It's cool. The geometry of nature is just phenomenal. So there it is. A succulent plant holder in the shape of a sphere. Now this happens to be a piece of spalted pecan, which is just beautiful wood. So I've just left it natural. But if you have a more plain wood, you could stain it. You could put a color dye on it. You could do all sorts of things. You're only, you're only limited by your imagination. But I really love the shape of this, this perfect little sphere in this 
flame of a plant coming out of the top of it. I think it turned out really cool. Leave me a comment below and let me know what you think of this and let me know if you're going to try this at home. Now, the other thing I get a lot of questions about is how do I make a waterproof container, like a cup that I can drink out of? And I don't know if I would be drinking out of a cup that I've put five minute epoxy in to kind of seal all of the, the pores in that. I'm sure there's a chemist out there that can tell us if that's safe or not, but I don't know. I wouldn't be drinking out of this. This plant is going to get a very small amount of water. It's going to get one tablespoon or 15 milliliters per month. Yeah, I looked that up. So it's only a small amount of, of water that's getting in there each month, and that plant is going to suck it up, and the soil is going to suck it up almost immediately. So there won't be much ex excess water that's going to you know, soak into the wood, and that's our biggest concern. We don't want to leave the wood wet. And we don't want it to be soaking up water because you're going to get mold and you're going to have problems like that if it stays wet for a long period of time. But these succulents are a great way to go because it doesn't require that much water. So that's really not going to be much of an issue. So leave me a comment below. Let me know what you think of this project. Let me know if you're going to do this project. And uh, let me know how it turns out. If you've liked this video, do me a huge favor and click that like button below the screen. It helps out this video and helps out the channel, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate you for clicking it. Thank you. And if you're not subscribing, please subscribe, all that good stuff. And if you want to make more bulls or if you want to learn more about turning wood bulls, check out my website, turnawoodbull.com. I've got tons of information for you over there. So, as always, like I like to end my articles and my videos with, until next time, happy turning.